Okay, 4.45. Uh, welcome. Uh, our next speaker, it will be Nick Reardon. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Brian. How's, how's the audio coming through? Perfect. Glad to hear it. Hi, everyone. Yeah, yeah thanks again, Brian, and thanks to, to all the organizers for this, this event, the Alaska Food Policy Council, and all the other awesome uh, presentation speakers. So my name is Nick Reardon. Uh, I don't have slides to accompany this presentation, so you can relax your eyes for a while and, and listen in. Don't, don't fall asleep unless you really need to. It has been quite a day. But I'm, I'm here to share a little bit about the connection, um, maybe a little less understood or obvious connection between food security for Alaskans and, uh, and chemical policy, which is something that we don't engage with nearly as much. Um, so, so what's being done and what, what could be done, either as individuals, organizations, as a state, as a nation, uh, to protect basically our access to healthy food. And uh, so I work for a nonprofit uh, in Anchorage called ACAT, the Alaska Community Action on Toxics. It's not to be confused with the uh, Alaska Cat Adoption Team, another ACAT and another fabulous organization or the Alaska Center for Appropriate Technology. Um, a fabulous organization as well, but Alaska Community Action on Toxics, um, where part of my job is to run monthly webinars on environmental health issues, like some of these chemicals that I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about today. And then the other half of my job there at ACAT is to coordinate their organic gardening program called Yardicopia. And so what I'm sharing actually is a little bit of sort of a slightly serendipitous um, realization or, or topic that comes from the two uh, hats that I wear at this organization. Um, one being, you know, how do we create healthy food? And the other one is these environmental health issues. Um, so yeah, together with the Alaska Food Policy Council, I also put together a little food system newsletter called Current Affairs, which is highlighting some of the, the kind of goings ons in food systems in South Central Alaska. That's kind of a personal geographic bias. And uh, you know, with even more of a bias probably towards Anchorage, and I'll just admit that up front. But I can pop the, the info if you if you want to check any of this out. Um, obviously, the uh, internet can be an amazing space. Let's see here. But that's just giving you links to yeah to ACAT to these webinars, the Che Alaska series, um, Yardicopia, the gardening program, and Current Affairs. And you can just reach out to me directly if you want to get that in your inbox. It's all free and. I'm always accepting um, input there too. But so to the reason why I'm, uh, I'm here today to talk to you is, um, well, so ACAT at large, we're working to protect everyone's right to clean air, clean water and toxic free food. So that's kind of the tie in here. Uh, it's hard to create healthy food if you don't have clean air and clean water and clean soil to do it with. So it's a sentiment that I imagine many of you listening share and uh, we work on the mission in lots of different ways. Um, you can advocate it for at the policy level, creating laws that are protective of these rights, um, you know, international, national, state level, municipal level. But we also work directly with Alaskans. And so that's kind of more like the gardening program would be an example of this. We get questions, we get requests for assistance. And so we sometimes will be pairing folks up. Um, who need more space to grow or just want to learn how to grow in methods, uh, you know, in an urban environment. Um, and so we're working, uh, sometimes pairing people up with the Yardicopia program. People donate space, their neighbors, their churches, their schools. And, um, and so we pair them up with people who are looking for more space to grow. And so I'm happy to talk more about that another time. But um, but this, this program, why I bring it up in part is because it acts as an entry point sometimes for folks to start asking questions and learning more about toxic chemicals in our environment and the ways in which they could be problematic um, in terms of getting into our food and into ourselves. So yeah, I really say this all for context. I spend a lot of time thinking about how to grow and harvest toxic free food and to keep soils clean. Um, and this can be in the focus of, you know, in Anchorage area, but it also pertains to wild harvests. 
um, and, and gathering foods on Alaska is a big place. So on the many private and public uh, landscapes and ecosystems that we, that we share. So yeah, and, and there's, there's, there's sort of two, two ways that we come across these toxic chemicals. One of them is for little or not so little, but localized issues. So in my experience in Anchorage, we're often talking about advice and best practices around avoiding you know, lead, um, lead paint or lead from gasoline or petroleum-based chemicals that could contaminate soils if someone was you know, running a little auto body shop out in their backyard and then another family moves in and wants to grow kale. There's some inconsistencies there with use. And so, uh, yeah, these best practices are pretty widely available on the internet from neighbors, from friends. I think a lot of us here in Anchorage uh, we're really, a lot of us use raised beds for a variety of reasons, but one of which uh, in, in Anchorage is that we're concerned about what the soil might contain. And so we might exclude it by building and growing on top of it. This isn't applicable, this isn't uh, practical on an agricultural scale, obviously, um, but in a small backyard garden, you can build up and sort of get yourself away from potential contamination. There's other methods, people, you know, they till in, they kind of dilute it, you add a lot of organic matter and other things like avoiding old or treated lumber, you know, arsenic as a preservative of wood is no longer used. And so this is again, just sort of a, a best practice that is pretty well advertised out there with lots of information, even just avoiding areas. So steering clear of the edge of your house, if it's an old building, they might have lead paint, steering clear of, you know, soils near roads. Um, this again is, is kind of uh, good best practices that are out there and, and I think manageable. That's, that's maybe the, the theme there, uh, not just that there's information available, but that you can, um, you can manage those as an individual with a little piece of property or a big piece of property. Um, so this here more, the issue that I have, I mean, it's not, it's not a new issue, but that I've become interested in lately and I'm sort of here to partly to inform or to talk about but to also ask for help is is that um, I don't have a solution for this one and I'm not even really sure that it's solvable as an individual gardener um, and that's how to address contamination of water or soil and food um, from sources pollution that's beyond our city that's beyond our state or even our national boundaries and so this is where the chemical policy becomes kind of a, um, a needed tool perhaps. But an example of this problem would be a group of chemicals called PBTs, um, pardon the acronym, but the, the gist of it is that they're, they're highly mobile. And so we don't get to choose whether they're coming in and out of our gardens or our farms or our entire you know, ecosystems that support population, wild populations of fish or caribou or what have you. And uh, these chemicals, they, they're coming out of smokestacks or they're sprayed as pesticides in agricultural fields. They're used to make products fire resistant. The list goes on and on. Um, the, the classification PBT isn't, isn't defining particular like elements that are present. They don't need to have fluorine or carbon or something, but they do have these three traits. The, the P, for example, stands for persistence, meaning they don't degrade. So we create them and we might've created some of them in the seventies. Um, yeah, thank you, Brian. <laughs> um, and they're still with us. Uh, in fact, some of them are even called forever chemicals. And yeah, I'll say, so backing up one step here is that the fact that they're mobile, that they're volatile, means that they easily turn into a vapor. And so they're able to travel with the wind and they fall with the rain or the snow. And uh, so they, in fact, have a, a, a pesky habit of concentrating in higher latitudes. So places like Alaska, with falling rain and snow, it freezes into glaciers, into permafrost, into sea ice. So Alaska doesn't create many of these chemicals, but we get our more than our fair share, arguably, from the sky uh, as our you know, frozen landscapes melt. This can be seasonally, this can be the result of climate change, 
uh, but the state is in other high latitude regions have acted as a sink for these chemicals and sort of a stockpile. And so more and more being released. But back, back to the, the acronym, we're talking about this. So PBT, the P is, is this persistence, um, very strong chemical bonds basically. So they don't go away in a natural environment. The B stands for bioaccumulative. And that's really a problematic one when you're talking about harms to humans or animals or plants. But what it means is that these chemicals are able to be stored in an organism uh, generally faster than they're excreted. And that's kind of a bummer. So over the organism's lifetime, whether you're a bacteria, an earthworm, uh, a seal, a salmon, or a human, uh, assuming exposure continues, more and more of it ends up in their tissue. And so a small quantity of this chemical may not be particularly problematic over your lifetime, um, but larger quantities do become problematic. And so this gets worse in the context of a food chain where larger organisms eat smaller ones. Instead of bioaccumulative, they call this biomagnification. And uh, this is particularly problematic in ocean where food chains are longer, if that makes sense. The, on land, you might have lichen growing on a rock that's eaten by a caribou, and that's kind of, that could be the end of the food chain. The caribou is then consumed by a wolf or a human or a bear, and the, that's the end of the story. In, in a marine environment, you might have many more steps along the way, and each step, each time a, a, an animal is consumed by another, there's an opportunity there to concentrate uh, these, these chemicals in the, the large organism's body. And so it's seals, sea mammals, um, large long-lived whales, this is, this is an issue, um, large fish. Um, and, and again, I'm not, this isn't supposed to be a doom and gloom situation. This is more supposed to be of, of interest and kind of informative. They're, these aren't eat, eat your wild foods eat your harvested foods. I can't stress that enough, but this is, this, is a, this is a concern I think that could use more attention and is not getting better. It's getting worse as we proceed. So we're, we're lucky that we can, some of us particularly privileged individuals can continue to eat food and not experience the harms of this. Other people are already experiencing the harms of this because their food system relies on animals and plants where they feel the repercussions of this more abruptly. So relying on a marine food system, for example, would be problematic, uh, depending on what you're eating, uh, or more problematic than somebody who um, is eating lower down the food chain. I love, the, I love the links, Brian. You're really fleshing this out for me. I appreciate it. So the... The last, the, we really take note. PBT is easy, is quick to say, but I'm explaining it over a long time period. So persistent and bioaccumulative, and the T I've alluded to is that it, they're toxic. Uh, to be to be grouped as a PBT, toxicity has to be high at a very low concentration. Um, we're not just throwing anything in there that's persistent and bioaccumulative. It also needs to be harmful to health. And so these chemicals that are associated with a range of adverse health effects. It's, uh, it's nothing good. Um, these aren't things that you would wish upon anyone, not onto any animals. These aren't things that, um, you know, this is our immune system. This is the way children's brains develop, um, the, how our, you know, cancers. This is, um, it's, it's, yeah, no one's voting for more of these chemicals in anyone's bodies. I think it's, it's just the acknowledgement that current systems are in place that allow these chemicals to arrive in our ecosystems and sometimes into ourselves. Uh, and so we just need to improve regulations and laws uh, accordingly, I think, with this understanding. It's easy to say, much more challenging to do perhaps in, in our complex world, but Moving, it's, this isn't a problem that's isolated to PBTs, this, this group of chemicals. Um, you also see this in microplastics or just plastics at large, um, but microplastics or, or nanoplastics, just smaller and smaller pieces of plastic. Uh, we could talk about plastics themselves, that's sort of a whole nother kettle of fish, but 
Alaska's very own Dr. Sonia Nagorski in the University of Southeast uh, or University of Alaska in the Southeast in Juneau. She's been working with her graduate students for quite a few years now, monitoring the presence of microplastics um, in glaciers, rivers, forests, beaches. Basically, she tried to look everywhere kind of uh, in these different zones around Juneau and uh, to see if microplastics were present and found them everywhere. And she's not alone. Most, any, any paper that I've read about microplastics, basically if a scientist or somebody, uh, citizen scientist looks for microplastics, you find microplastics because similar to PBTs, they're mobile, they're tr being transported uh, by wind, they're, they're in the air, they're in the atmosphere, moving on ocean currents, atmospheric currents, and so they fall again with the rain and the snow, and probably sometimes just falling out of the, the, the wind, but the, uh, and that's, maybe that's a bit of a bummer, um, just knowing that, that the microplastics are being spread all over the earth, um, but Again, this is a, this, I'm here to talk a little bit about chemical policy. And so where the microplastics become an issue in that context is that to make chemicals, or sorry, to make plastics do all sorts of different things. It's one of the reasons why they're so abundant and so useful uh, is because we can add different chemicals to plastics and we can make them clear or we can make them flexible or UV resistant. That's a pretty cool one. Um, we can make them stronger and it's, yeah, the, the, the chemicals that we add, it turns out, are um, fit, fit into this category. They are able to enter our bodies. And um, BPA is, a, is the classic example that comes to my mind. I remember, I think, in high school or college. But, but hearing that, oh, my gosh, our water bottles are all like this, this plastic uh, where is now we shouldn't use it. You know, we got to get rid of it. It contains BPA. And uh, it mimics a hormone, basically, in our body. Um, so it's endocrine disrupting is the terminology, but this is this is an issue. We've we've we're using this to store food, to carry food, and we're now spreading it all over our environment. So it's in our soils and our waters, and it has these chemicals in it that uh, are harmful to human health. And um, not every single one of the chemicals, but many of them have been identified um, to be harmful to human health. And so it. Again, it, it just puts in jeopardy this, <laughs> this food system that we rely on and that we're also, I think, interested in, and rightly so committed to strengthening. Um, and I would hate to see it being, you know, eroded, the, 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 the food security being eroded or compromised um, by the spread of these persistent chemicals that are, it's, it's a lot easier to not put them out there than trying to get them back. It's a bit of a cat out of the bag sort of situation, if that term makes sense. So, one other aspect about the BPA um, example is that I think it's not that we stopped having plastics that could do what plastics with BPA added could do. Um, BPA was restricted and it took, you know, probably years and years of scientific research and, uh, and policy change and laws, advocating, lobbying, um, a huge amount of effort to get those restrictions in place. And then what you get sometimes, it's really unfortunate, is you get BPB um, is then added. And I'm, I apologize, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm trained as an earth scientist. So uh, I've been learning about these things for the, I have an academic background. I'm, I'm not afraid of scientific research papers, um, but this isn't something I have a PhD in or anything like that. But the I understand that, that there's a thing called regrettable substitutions where a policy is created or a restriction is created around a chemical because right and so it's like, oh shoot, this mimics our hormones and hormones control a lot of our body functions. So that's probably not a good thing to have in our water bottles, for example. Um, but replacing it with BPB isn't necessarily the best idea. BPB, very similar chemical structure to BPA. Um, you don't have to take my word for it or perhaps uh, read <laughs> some of these articles. If Brian's getting up there, um, but that's, it's not, uh, it, it has, again, it still imitates a hormone in your body. It doesn't, it doesn't actually address the underlying issue. And so these policies, the chemical policy needs to be thoughtful and it needs to be uh, created with care. And um, to, to not do that is sort of a missed opportunity. And there's historical examples of this. So we get to learn from those, those historical examples where it wasn't you know, where issues arose, there were regrettable substitutions and we can try to stop that from happening in the future. 
So yeah, that's that's partly why I'm here really is, um, is that you know, individually we can try to mitigate contamination on you know, our little piece of property, whether we rent it or own it, or we're gardening with friends or we're harvesting fish from the ocean. You know, we can try to care for these little patches of land, but I think there's, there's also this need um, for, for action at another level, uh, many other levels. But the, you can kind of leap to the farthest, the international level is important too. Uh, smokestacks can be anywhere on the globe and be creating these substances that travel around, you know, with atmospheric currents, um, with oceanic currents. And so it, it's, uh, it's, hard to, it, it's hard to have your blinders on this day and age. These things are, are reaching far afield. So a common thread in the literature review that I did about, again, I run a gardening program, that's part of my job, um, is that one way to keep your soils um, not necessarily free of these chemicals, but it's like a short-term solution, is having a healthy soil ecosystem. Because these, I'm going out on a little bit of a limb here um, in terms of my you know, scientific understanding of this, but from reading lots of papers, a common thread that came through that I do think has value is that these chemicals are bioaccumulative, so they happen to go into organic matter, and that can occur in the soil um, long before it makes it onto your dinner plate. Your compost or your, the bacteria, the arthropods, the earthworms, I could go on, but these, act, these living or dead, this organic matter will I think will absorb some of these chemicals and act as a local sink. It's not ideal. It's not like it's removing these chemicals or degrading them, but it's um, perhaps better from you know, my own perspective if the bacteria do that or the earthworms do that and it doesn't make it into the, the food that I'm growing in my little garden patch. But this doesn't resolve the issue on an agricultural scale. I understand agricultural soils often have less organic matter just from you know, the, the method of farming. Um, and so it's sort of impractical to, to always create you know, the, the most thriving of soil ecosystems on a, on a hundred acre farm. So that buffer may not exist there to, to, to protect the plants, which are another you know, form of organic matter, which can indeed absorb some of these chemicals. So, yeah, the problem remains basically. The source hasn't gone away. And so we can take these steps and I encourage everyone to have a healthy, bountiful uh, garden um, or to you know, support local farmers and, and fisher people and all that. But the, the problem, the source hasn't gone away and I don't think it will um, unless we find alternatives on the national and international scale. So global production of plastic is only ramping up. Um, that's a that's a well I think well researched fact that that's you know the new direction for petroleum to go instead of into our gas tanks um, and my understanding is also the list of PBTs isn't is growing it's not shrinking that's one of the problems with it being a list of persistent uh, chemicals so they're not easy to degrade or if they degrade at all and so the takeaway point from all of this is that we have individual localized mitigation that we can exercise but we're not addressing the source. So I think that's where it's important um, for us as individuals to, yeah, uh, con you know, educate ourselves on these issues. Um, that's, that's nice. I think, again, I mentioned the, the webinar series uh, earlier. This, um, it's called Che Alaska, but we have these monthly, but we've had, I think over 160 of these different calls on different environmental health uh, topics. And they're totally recorded, free to access to anyone. Um, and, and so that, that can be a way to learn from experts on these topics. But I mean, I realize as an individual in my own life, no one wants to be an expert in it. Like you just don't have the time to be an expert in any, everything. And so it's also useful to, rely on specialists and experts to try to, to, to control these things. So that, that is what ACAT's mission is. Um, and I found it interesting to learn about the ways that they've been trying to do this for now 30 plus years. Um, something that gives me hope is, is, there, is the existence of these, um, there's the existence of these conventions um, through the UN. So, I mean, it's an agreed upon like global issue 
Um, and they, they've been created at various decades, but they're essentially groups of experts and they assess at the international level, they assess and develop criteria for identifying chemicals that we need to act on, that we need to restrict on a global level. Um, and again, this could be stuff coming out of smokestacks, this could be hazardous waste being shipped between countries, this could be pesticide application. The list is long for, for different uses. Oh, great. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I'll, I can share that again, the, the webinar link. There's like a, an example of just like a specific thing that's going on right now is PFOS. These um, they're, they're fluorinated compounds that are used in all sorts of different things to be stain and stick resistant. The Alaska State House and Senate has the HB 121 and SB 171. Uh, it's in committees and it's a question of whether legislators will vote to pass this, um, creating restrictions and kind of rules around what happens when you identify that this contaminant is in our water um, and getting into people. So whether that moves through the House and the Senate, I think is really a matter of how much pressure our representatives receive from ourselves. There's so much that you know, a nonprofit or an organization can do, can do but I think it's also important for some of us to pick up the phone and um, you know, writing letters to the editor, I think really helps. These are, these are sort of the individual actions that are really useful. And, uh, and it, it helps ACAD, I know, to have individual support on, you know, to, for this sort of like letter writing campaigns and to basically let politicians know that this is important to Alaskans. It's, uh, if they don't hear from us, they don't know that it's an issue. Um, so I know this isn't you know, the most food focused talk of today's conference, but I hope that you can see the, the connection, the problems um, that like clean air and water and soil, um, when those are compromised, our food system is also compromised. And uh, yeah, if anyone, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to, to throw them into the chat. I can, uh, oh good. Yeah, thanks for throwing it in there, Brian. I know there's, there's also some steps being taken with, with regard to plastics. Um, simply having, this is gonna sound really crazy, but you've probably heard of the milkman, you know, an exchange, instead of, if we can't create plastics that don't require toxic chemicals um, to be used in them, um, if that's not a viable option, we can, we have a safe substance, we can use glass. And there are, there are many rules that already exist we don't have to create this as Alaskans, be as a legislator or as a, simply a resident. Um, these rules and laws exist in other states and other countries. And it's a matter of assessing which ones would work well for Alaska or for particular communities and implementing them. But they're, they're out there. I'll just share one here, some info on a, on a, a bottle bill, which is basically a law, a, a mandatory law about having deposits so that it encourages recycling. My mom would tell me about how that's, she would get her money for buying candy by returning glass bottles. Um, it's just grabbing this from the past. And you know, we didn't know that plastics were going to you know, have these, that these chemicals were toxic, but upon realizing it, I think it's, it's about time to, to reflect on that and perhaps return to a system, a modified version of it that works well for us today. Um, especially in the context of all the, the harms to health that we will have to, you know, bear uh, as, as individuals and communities and a nation. But I'll, yeah, I'll leave it there, guys. I think we're, we're coming up on the end of my time. Um, so Some timing, Nick. Reach out. Yeah, you got about two minutes left uh, for the audience. If you have a uh, question you want to ask Nick, uh, just unmute yourself and fire away, or you can po post it in the chat, both this um, video recording and the, the chat are going to be are recorded for um, future viewing. Or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. And I'm not a chemist by training, <laughs> but, but I do know something about chemistry, you know, better living through, you know what, right? <laughs> yeah yeah i hear you <laughs> yeah. cool well thanks thanks for everyone for, for listening i'm looking forward to uh 
yeah, be, anyway, happy to chat. I've just brought my contact info in there. This is, is my job as well as something that I'm quite interested in. And there's, I'm part of a team of, there's eight of us here in Anchorage. There's people out in uh, St. Lawrence Island and uh, in Southeast. And um, so we're, uh, yeah, this is, this is what we do. So, so please reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Um, we're happy to, to share more about it. All right. On that happy note, <laughs> on a very difficult subject. Thanks again, uh, Nick. Round of applause from everybody. Um, yeah, you're getting a lot of kudos in the chat. Um, so you really, you really hit a target that um, people are concerned about. So thank you for providing us this, uh, this without a PowerPoint, which is even better because you know just talk to talk. All right. Um, I think now we move on to our next presentation. There is no break. We're, we're continuing in session 4A. Um, I believe uh, Art Nash is giving a presentation, if I'm correct, or Leslie Shellcross. Let's see if I got this right. And, oh. Okay, I see Art, I see uh, a nice family picture there. Can you unmute and take it away? Or if you're having difficulty on that, uh, send something in the chat and we'll have our experts solve. Oh, there's there's Leslie coming on board. So Leslie, are you going to be giving the talk? You're still trying to, you're still trying to connect, Leslie. Um, either you or Na, Art Nash are, are going to present. So the floor is yours, if you're ready. Yeah, hang on one second. I've just gotten on, and I'll get my my uh, my presentation up and get rid of. <laughs> I know we're... <laughs> the bright sun that's shining in here. Oh, lucky you! It's it's snowing in Kodiak, so uh... it is. <laughs> and we're in the same state. Yikes. Oh, Art says he's ready, but I'm muted. Um, gosh, I wonder why you're oh. muted. Let me see. Ask to unmute. He has to unmute. You should be able to. I don't understand why. Okay, and I'm going to... I'm going to keep working to try to get art in here more. Okay, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if we got... Oh, man. I, I'm going to try to go through my other thing and find out why I can't unmute. And hopefully he can join us. I just sent a note to our our tech crew. Okay. And so, uh, are you going to lead off, um, Leslie? I mean, sometimes. Well, he was gonna. He was going to lead off, and I know that sometimes. Um, sometimes he's got connectivity issues, um, but. Uh, Okay, they're working on it. So I think you'll just have to take it away, Leslie, and hopefully we'll get Art in here in just a okay. minute. Whoops. Oh Maybe I'll gosh. mute myself. Maybe that'll help. Oh my gosh. Whoop, there we go. Um, oh my gosh. Hold on. This is... Okay, so I'll... Let's see here. I don't want this to take up my whole screen. So, you know, it's it's after the working day, and I think Zoom is tired too. <laughs> Zoom's, Zoom's probably tired. That makes sense. Oh, that's great. All yeah. right. Okay. So let's see if I can get a. No. 
don't know how to play my how do I turn it on? I how see your I, I see your slide set, but you need to go yeah. to your first slide and just say yeah. from start or something like that. Oh, I see. Oh this man. Is, uh, Art, can you hear me okay? Oh yeah. Okay. I, I just had to uh, apparently drop out and come back in. By the way, I uh, very much enjoyed the previous uh, presentation by uh, ACAT. <laughs> so excellent. Uh, it was excellent. So I want to just introduce uh, going into this to let folks know um, why we've chosen this topic. So Leslie and I work for Cooperative Extension. Our responsibility is to take the research from the university out to the general public and to interface where the needs are. Often when there are blackouts, such as there seems to have been somewhat of an increasing level, at least in South Central and in, um, in the interior, Leslie who deals with food and myself who deals with energy, will get various calls that cross over. They may be questions about uh, preparing particular foods with particular types of energy or such as that. A few years ago, we realized that it was probably a good idea as we started to see an uptick in outages that were more than maybe two days long to start to address for those who might be leaving the property and coming back, uh, going to a hotel for a couple of days or such as that, uh, or those who are deciding to stay in place uh, that they were really um, needful of guidance on making sure that um, when they opened up the freezer and the fridge uh, and went in and consumed the food that there weren't going to be any bad surprises. <laughs> so, um, so we started doing this about five years ago or such. And um, we focus for the most part in looking at uh, blackouts from the point of view, or I do anyway, of if you have a limited amount of energy, uh, such as maybe in a small suitcase generator that's 2KW or such like that, where are you going to go ahead and concentrate that limited power? And if it's in the winter, in South Central or in the interior, Resoundingly, the answer is I want heat to make sure that my pipes don't freeze. And mm -hmm. then the next thing I want, and sometimes it's the first thing, is to make sure that the refrigerator and the freezer are working. Because usually with the old Coleman green suitcase two burner, you can take care of the cooking uh, and uh, through various means take care of heating water and such uh, by means that people have. But the refrigerator and the freezer, making sure that things are um, are of good, um, uh, good quality uh, or making decisions on what you're not going to even try. So uh, Leslie, um, uh, I'll go ahead and let you advance the slide um, to the first slide here. Um, so, you know, with sudden power outages, it can certainly curtail your ability to cook depending on whether you have an electric range or what, or microwave uh, can curtail also having hot water for washing dishes. And if you're gonna be in place for several days, it's important to get the dishes washed so that we don't have, um, you know, uh, bad scenarios of using dirty pans and such and possibly getting in an uncomfortable situation. And then also keeping the foods cold and frozen. Next slide. Whoops, sorry. Oh, that's okay. So um, in a class that I teach on Blackout Backup, there are some very nifty gadgets that you can get to use right outside of the home that consume wood and help to heat water cooking, such as the Kelly kettle, or can even make electricity, such as small biolight stoves that are used in camp situations, or sometimes even um, uh, on-demand hot water heaters. Art, Art uh, can you see the slides? Yeah, sure can. It's the Kelly okay. kettle there. Okay. And so there are these different products that are on the market that people have been getting and putting in their kits for emergency preparedness, seven days of supplies uh, in Alaska is what the suggestion is of water and food and other supplies. And so then these, I, these uh, items can help them whether they stay in place on the property or whether they end up uh, having to leave the property, such as in a tsunami situation. Uh, next. 
And um, um, you know, oh, is it? I mean, most mostly. So you had you had a few slides here that I thought this was interesting art, something uh, I hadn't seen before. The car, boy, if you can run the car and then you can get a small inverter uh, with the 12 volt uh, plug, uh, then you can go ahead and power or not power, but you can go ahead and have crock pot or electric hot plate. And they do make now small console between the bucket seats of the front car refrigerators in case there's medications or something that you really need to uh, have um, on hand that has to stay cool that you just plug into 12 volt, as well as they also have heated lunch boxes now and small cookers that you can plug into your 12 volt in your car. So remember that even if you don't have a regular generator, if you have gasoline in the car and the tailpipe is not obstructed by snow or something else that can give problems with carbon monoxide backing into the car, you have a generator in your driveway. Yeah. And so as long as you can access it, um, your power off your 12 volt battery will be used to power the car. And then you have an alternator that re, uh, recharges that battery. Uh, much like a solar cell or a small wind turbine would. Um, next. Okay, so we got the Kelly kettle. Yeah, Kelly Already. kettle, an item that uh, can uh, be used for cooking on the top of. You can get a crosshairs for them. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you're just using spare wood that's around. And, yeah. I, uh, yeah, a yeah jet. one of the great things about the Kelly kettle, and it, it is that you've got a good size volume of water there and it takes very little fuel. So you can use little tiny twigs and things like that. So it's easy. Yeah. Be sure. And we're not endorsing any particular product. We just try to make people aware of what's out there on the market so they can do their own investigation. The BioLite stoves, uh, these have a small uh, thermal electric, uh, electrothermal device, much like a Stirling engine that stores uh, battery power from the burning of the wood that goes in horizontally. So you can cook on top and you can even get like a pizza hat on it to make a pizza or such like that. They have a whole cadre of items that go with this, but you can uh, then tap that five watt uh, plug-in uh, for LED Christmas lights to string around the room. Uh, or for charging your cell phone. So these are all helpful devices. Um, whenever you burn anything and combust it, whether it's white gas in the Coleman, such as uh, we have on the next slide, or wood here, we always want to make sure that we do it uh, not in the house uh, without ventilation, uh, because carbon monoxide is a byproduct of any kind of fuel that we burn. Uh, next. Want me, want me to go yeah. past this one? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and go on past it. Thanks. Okay. Okay. And uh, I would also say that uh, charcoal can be used um, as well as, uh, but it should be used in the grill outside um, because it will emit carbon monoxide. And there's a host of things that you can do in your fireplace. Uh, we had a channel, well, one of the new spots in Anchorage a stage in uh, Leslie's house where she had a good fireplace with a grate and we show that you can put wood underneath and then cook as long as there hasn't been a situation where it's damaged the chimney or the flue so that you can have the exhaust gases go up. Right, not, not something that you want to do if the emergency was uh, an earthquake and there was any kind of um, potential damage to your chimney. But um, a good way. All of right. Cooking. So here's our lineup. Here's just a few elements that people keep on hand for emergency preparedness. These are all wood burners of one type or another. Uh, next. And in an emergency where you only have cinder blocks, it's very easy to make a very efficient stove. Um, by just using uh, four cinder blocks and knocking the wall out of the middle one, the end wall, and then putting your fuel all the way back to the throat of, of where you see the fire coming up. And it, it heats up the brick or the cinder block 
And as long as the pan's not just flat on the okay. cinder block, it allows a draft of air to come up in an L shape and is very efficient. Also, you can buy items uh, that you wouldn't need to necessarily have a pan that you could have on hand, uh, such as the, um, the racket looking device on your left that's hinged that you can slice meats and vegetables that you might not be sure are gonna last in your refrigerator for very much longer. You maybe have been out for uh, a day or two and not sure uh, and things that are fine if you're gonna reuse them. So uh, you might as well eat them in place as long as you're still determining that they're safe. And uh, this little um, uh, racket is a good way to do it. And they're yeah. usually very reasonable price under $20. Um, on this one, let's just skip to the next, Leslie, just because I have uh, kind yeah. of eaten up too much so, time. Yeah, that's okay. So that's the that's the end of the devices art. Yep. And so next art's is the, art's the device expert. <laughs> um, and really, this we we plan this to be a very short presentation, mostly just focused on. What, a, what what happens if the power goes out to your refrigerator but we didn't want to we didn't want to miss the opportunity to talk about being being prepared for emergencies and so um, if you're talking about um, eating during an emergency the first thing that you really need to be talking about is do you have water and just for um, for your own uh, purposes, uh, you really want to, and Art mentioned it already, you want to be prepared with at least one gallon of water per day. I mean, the recommendations vary between two quarts and one gallon. One gallon will give you um, a little bit more um, wiggle room in terms of having some water for um, for washing and stuff like that. But, um, you know, in Alaska, we we go with uh, at least a week being prepared for at least a week. So so seven gallons per person per day. And um, the best thing to do, in my estimation, and also the the recommendations from CDC is that commercially bottled water is probably your easiest and best way to um, to to have that around is just to buy bottled water and, and keep it. Um, you know, um, if, if that's not possible, and if you don't wanna um, have that much plastic uh, around, you can, um, you can bottle water yourself. Um, you wanna make sure that you Put the water into sanitized containers, and also if your water. A lot of us in um, a lot of us in Fairbanks, and probably a lot of other places in Alaska, um, don't uh, get don't get water from a chlorinated water system. And you really want to make sure that the water that you put into the bottles is also clean. So you're going to want to add some uh, some bleach to them. Um, one of the things that you want to, uh, we, we kind of went, went by our, our first slide on, on what, to, what to have on hand, but you should have in your emergency gear um, bleach. And it should be five to 10%, five to 9% sodium hypochlorite. And it'll say on it, you want, um, you don't, want bleach that has um, um, perfumes and, and fragrances and things like that in it. Um, Art mentioned cleaning. Um, good. This is a good place to have paper towels and, and paper plates and cups. Um, and so that you don't have to, um, don't have to spare your water um, for, for cleaning dishes, okay? Um, and Art talked about having having um, ways to cook, to so that you can um, so you can enjoy yourself, sort of, at least with uh, at least with some food. So um, so what about what about the food? 
Um, again, in preparing your pantry, um, again, you're gonna think about water and you're gonna think about the cooking options. Um, as you plan, you also wanna think about uh, exactly who am I, who am I planning for? What are their ages? Do they have special medical needs? Um, little children or even seniors may have some real specific requirements. And, and again, if, if there are special medical conditions involved, you want to make sure that your, uh, that your store on your shelf has, um, has, has foods that are appropriate for everyone. Um, let's see. So, you know, we, we sometimes think about making things lightweight and low volume, and especially if you're going to be, if you think you're going to have to take food and go. Um, otherwise, you still probably want things to be low volume, but also have, have um, enough calories uh, to, to feed you. Um, things should be easily prepared. Um, things should have a long shelf life, and you should have things that you and your family are going to um, enjoy. Emergency situations and power outages are stressful, and you don't want to add to that stress um, by, by not having something there that is um, acceptable to you, and, to, to you and your family. Um, so... So just think about those things. Um, so you see a pantry here, and this pantry is not necessarily representative of, of everything that you would, you would want, um, but it's there because what I want to want to mention, you're like, okay, well, how am I going to have that much food around? Um, for, you know, for at least a week, enough shelf stable food to feed myself and my family. Well, see what you have now, kind of take an inventory and think, and then start adding things to it um, gradually. You don't have to get it there all at once, but then make sure that you're rotating out what you have in storage, even with your water, you know, stored water, um, after six months or so, you you want that to be re, kind of re recycled. Um, but but with your um, with your foods on a shelf, sure they're going to stay for a long time, but they're not going to be great for a long time. So go ahead and make sure that you're rotating those. All right. So obvious things canned canned foods canned vegetables fruits juices beverages coffee tea um, peanut butter nut butters um, you know crackers are probably gonna are gonna be more what you want um, bread bread may or may not um, last for a week so um, so bread so crackers are probably a better thing to have as an emergency um, food all right so how much how much do you need I'm I put this in here because I think that it's it's kind of nice to get um, a, a fix on amounts that you might want to keep around um, and um, this this is some just a little bit of guidance for you. People people have different eating patterns, so different um, different amounts in different categories. But this would be about what you would think about for a day. Now, um, as as grown ups, most of us probably aren't having um, three cups of milk a day. But certainly this would help help meet our calorie needs as well as our nutrient needs um, in terms of meeting our protein needs, about five and a half ounces per person per day. Fruits and vegetables um, and five cups a day. Grain foods, about six ounces. Um, and then 
other things as as are appropriate for you and your family. All right. So we're getting to the to the real meat of this. Um, so it's really important. And on our list there, I think I had a thermometer up there next to the bleach. I hope so. Anyway, one thing that I that is critical for food safety, whether you're in an emergency or whether you're just at home, is to have a thermometer in your refrigerator or your freezer. If um, you know if your if your freezer isn't full, you may want to put um, some containers that you have some water in in the freezer and have have some frozen water. One thing, it helps your freezer stays colder if it's full. And if you have ice in your freezer, um, you'll be able to tell when that freezer goes above 32 degrees, which is important for safety. Um, again, with your, uh, with your refrigerator, um, depending upon the temperature, your refrigerator is only going to stay cold to that, you know, safe temperature zone, which is below um, 40. Um, it's only going to stay cold probably for about four hours or so. And you want to remember that um, if, if, you, if it's winter, of course, you may have the opportunity to put things into clean coolers and, um, and put them on a porch or put them someplace where they're not necessarily gonna freeze, but they can stay cold, maybe a garage space um, where it's gonna be cold. But again, you're gonna wanna have a thermometer there. Um, so food safety during an emergency is really what we're what we're about here. So how you and you definitely don't want in an emergency situation to get sick. So it's it's important that you that you think about it. Um, and here's your guideline, which which works whether it's an emergency or or your Thanksgiving dinner. Whoop, that happened. So. Throw away leftovers and perishable foods that have been held above 40 degrees for more than two hours. Okay, so if you go into your refrigerator, and of course you've got a thermometer in there, um, <clears throat> and you see that it's above 40 degrees, you're going to have to think quick. What should I do? If you have meats, poultry, fish, seafood, <coughs> lunch meats, hot dogs, if they have been above 40 degrees for more than two hours, they are not safe to eat. Um, milk, cream cheese, sour cream, yogurt, um, cream cheese, cottage cheese, soft cheeses, soy milk and eggs also are things that you would need to avoid. Hard cheeses, however, and processed cheese, um, butter and margarine could can be kept. So here's our, we've got a, a two pages here of, of our list. Um, so freezers, again, it depends on the kind of freezer you have. If you've got a, um, if you've got a chest freezer and if it's in a place that's not real warm, it may stay pretty cold for, for quite a while, even, even when there are warmer temperatures. When I, when I moved when I moved to Fairbanks from Anchorage, I was trying to defrost this little chest freezer that I had and, and, it's, and I unplugged it and I even opened it up and it's, it, there was a lot of ice in it for, for many days. But 
You don't know if it's safe unless you've got a, <coughs> a thermometer in there. But the other thing that you can do is you can inspect the, the food that's there. Um, if you've got fish and shellfish, um, that's that is uh, that are uncooked um you could go ahead and cook them if they have defrosted okay but again it, whoop, what happened there what happened whoop. okay so um but if they on this slide. All right, back to back to something else. Okay, so fruit. So if you have frozen things in the in the refrigerator or freezer, if they're still cold, if they're still under forty degrees, no problem. If they're completely thawed, they are probably still going to be safe. Um, they may ferment if they hang around for a long time. Same thing with fruit juice concentrates. Um, vegetables, if they're partly thawed, you can still use them, um, but I would cook them and um, you can cook them. You can uh, go ahead and eat them. And if you have the ability, again, if it's like winter, like it is now, you could actually even cool them and, and refreeze. Um, meats and poultry, can you eat that from the freezer? Yes, if it's still partly frozen, okay? Um, you could take those out and cook them. You could even refreeze them um, if they seem if they seem normal. Okay. Um, variety meats. Okay. Don't um, don't uh, don't try and refreeze them. And certainly, if they have thawed completely, don't use them. All right, so um, again, here's what we're looking at. If they're partially thawed or if they're completely thawed. Okay, so back to this. So fish and shellfish, if it's been, uh, if it's been above um, that 40 degrees for more than two hours, do not use it. Um, cooked meat and poultry, say you had something that Maybe it was a leftover already, or um, maybe it was some kind of pre-prepared um, dish. Um, certainly don't refreeze it. Um, you could go ahead and, and thaw it out um, and make sure you use it within one to two days. So that's something like a, maybe a frozen dinner or something like that, okay? Um, combination dishes, pot pies, casseroles, whole meals. Um, you don't necessarily want to, to eat those again. They might not have been safe to start with and maybe aren't safe now. Um, soups, make sure you heat, reheat them. Um, uh, don't put them back in the freezer. Okay. Or uh, I'm sorry, if they if they've been out or if they've been warm for more than two hours, don't um, don't eat them. But if they're if they're still pretty cold, you can reheat them to 165 and freeze them. Um, ice cream, sherbet, uh, safe but poor quality. I kind of like liquid ice cream, but hey, that's me. Um, so what else do we have here that we need to be worried about? Fruit pies, you can eat them, you can eat bread, you can eat cakes and cookies, not cream filled cakes and cookies. So that is our what to do about food in a low energy situation. 
Does anybody have any any questions or comments or or concerns? And you should be able to unmute yourself and add a comment or a question. Um, big round of applause for Leslie and Art to wrap up the uh, first day of our conference. It's been a long one. Um, so does anyone have any burning questions as we uh, end toward the end here? Yeah, you guys hung in there. <laughs> long, long day. Now we're tough Alaskans, you know. We are. We are. Yep. As long as we have power, right, Matt? Art? <laughs> <laughs> of some kind, yeah. No power, no go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, it's been great. Um, I just had a one one question. You know, with all this concern about, um, you know consequences to our food. Have you ever come across any data or information of people who have come down with illnesses because they consume foods that were of a questionable, I mean, yeah, I'm a food oh. scientist and back yeah, in the yeah. day, but I haven't really seen, uh, that's really never rose to my radar because I'm, I'm guessing either it's not reported, which is a very common thing. And, you know, people don't report these kinds of illnesses if they do occur or they, they typically do, which is the first rule of thumb is with when in doubt, throw it out, as you said. You have do you have any other any I, anecdotal no, or <laughs> I haven't well, I haven't seen any um any statistics on that. You know, I'm I often do look at at statistics on uh, on food poisoning and and <laughs> you know, contamination of food, you know, how many how much contamination is there of fresh herbs? How much contamination? You know, right. one of the things, and and this, uh, I'm going to say this, even though what I've just told you may contradict it. <laughs> if you heat food hot enough and thoroughly, you are probably going to be okay. Right? Right. So right. not ideal not ideal and it's just imp it's important to remember that you could get food poisoning from from rice you could get food poison feel pretty bad from uh leftover rice that was spoiled you could certainly get food poisoning from from meats and fish and such um but if you if you heat those things hot enough you're probably going to be fine. The problem in, in a home situation and also certainly in an emergency situation where you may not have a really good way to heat. You know, you, you've got a burner and you've got a, a pan, but it might not be sufficient to, to actually get rid of the bacteria. And then of course, um, fish, you know, fish that's been heat um, traumatized um, could have some some toxins that you can't get rid of with heat, right? So um, this is true. So, yeah. 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 So um, yeah. Yeah. By the quality isn't the greatest, but. Um, <laughs> um, right. You're gonna you're gonna inactivate. Uh, uh, pathogens. Uh, yes. Yeah. For the most, for the most part, you're not going to get rid of spores of Clostridium botulinum, and you're not going to get rid of um, the enterotoxin from Staph aureus. But that, but the, but the other ones, you know, you're going to knock out Salmonella and you know enteropathogenic but, but these, I, I'm talking about things from the freezer. Ah, you know. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, it depends on what was the quality of microbial load going in? Because we know there's been problems right. uh, with right. listeria monocytogenes in ice cream, believe it or not. Mm. Uh, that, that happened down in Texas uh, several years ago. So it's always good to know your, your supplier. <laughs> and, that, and that wouldn't be something that you would be cooking. <laughs> not, not necessarily, but you could. <laughs> um. Yeah, listeria is a bad one. Right. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, and, and, yeah, yeah. And and uh, again, I don't want to be casual about it. When you freeze things, um, just so everybody knows, when you freeze things, if they have bacteria in them and microorganisms in them, when they go into the freezer, that kind of stops the microbial growth. But when they come back out, they those right. microorganisms get going and that's why anything that you you know anything that you took out of the freezer you'd have to make sure that it was heated really thoroughly and and um you know many things you're not going to be able to do do that well with during an emergency or power outage situation and um, food poisoning isn't uh, isn't a joke, and um, it can cause long term problems. Um, so, okay. Well, thanks yeah. again, um, Leslie and Art. Uh, it's been great. Thank you for for wrapping up on our our first day. 